Olivia Troy serves as an aide to Vice President Mike Pence before resigning during the Trump administration. She's now director of the Republican Accountability Project. And the aforementioned Miles Taylor is the former chief of staff of the Department of Homeland Security. He also resigned during the Trump administration, uh, which prompted one of John McEntee's employees to try and remove that nameplate bearing his name. I mentioned a moment ago, he now serves as the co-founder and executive director of the Renew America movement. Olivia, I just I'm curious, first of all, from the inside, how this tracks with your experience, um, the, the description of McEntee in this kind of obsessive, paranoid, quasi authoritarian enforcement of loyalty. I think it's very accurate. I, you know, it actually gave me chills because it reminded me of what it was like, especially when Johnny, as we called him inside the White House, uh, was appointed to head of presidential personnel early in 2020. And I remember having conversations uh, with senior cabinet level people, heads of, you know, the head of Homeland Security at the time, who had a conversation with me and said, I cannot staff qualified people right now because Johnny is blocking them. I can't get anyone through the pipeline. Now, this is placing qualified people in positions of national security, right? And this is the guy who was in charge of all of this. And so, and look, let me address the fear. The fear was real. It was well known that there were social media checks being conducted. I had a conversation with General Kellogg directly where he told me to watch my every move, uh, to be careful. I, you know, I, I, I chuckled a bit when I read about the Taylor Swift portion because I, I remember a moment early in the spring, I was really angry after a meeting where I had lost an argument with someone, something that I didn't agree with when it was related to the COVID pandemic. And I came back and was playing Taylor Swift very loud in my office late that night. And I had a colleague knock on the door and he said, are you trying to get fired? And I was super confused about that. And I was like, for being blunt in meetings or for for what? And he said, well, I don't, you know, I don't think she's a fan of Trump's. And so if somebody hears that, you, you should really watch her back. You should be careful on that. And that is just so astonishing to me, right? <laughs> it is late night. I'm allowed to listen to whatever music I want. But when you talk about the Gestapo, when it was mentioned in that article, this is sort of how this White House was run. And that is what I fear for the future of our country when some of these people are in power like this and, well, and they remain in power. Here's the irony here, right? I mean, at some level, because I'm talking to both you and Miles, I, I, I want your feedback on this. Because I'm talking about you, it's like you can be paranoid and be right, right? In the sense that it's true that a bunch of people in the administration viewed the president and the inner circle around him as a bunch of paranoid sociopaths who were going to destroy the country and viewed their mission as essentially making sure they couldn't. And so them running around being like, who are the traitors in the deep state is motivated by the fact that they are were indeed destructive, paranoid sociopaths. Like that's the original problem, Miles, that all of this flows from. Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, I didn't I didn't know Olivia's story before. We're, of course, friends. And if I'd known that playing Taylor Swift would get me fired, I would have been playing it way, way playing her music way earlier in the administration. But to, to your point, Chris, I've got to say this. When the hell are Trump supporters going to wake up? What else do they need to hear to understand that the man they support was viewed by his own lieutenants as a dangerous authoritarian overseeing a bunch of mini dangerous authoritarians. Now, we're not talking about a bunch of, quote, disgruntled employees like me and Olivia, which is what the president says we are. We're talking about his own former chief of staff, right. his own former national security advisor, his own former White House comms director. The list goes on and on. And these are people who've sounded the alarm and said that Trump's lieutenants were acting like the Gestapo. I mean, Alyssa Farah, who was one of his spokespeople, just said the other day that she feared a second term would deepen the United States into authoritarianism. So the concern is real. And I'll validate what Olivia said about this Jonathan Carl story. It's completely accurate. And you mentioned that plaque. Well, that same person who tried to pry my name off the plaque was the same person staffers at DHS were worried was literally going to come in and shoot up the plate. They were worried he was going to come in and potentially shoot people. His response to that, Chris, was, well, if they support Trump, then they have nothing to worry about. That was essentially the response. That sounded eerily to me like one of Hitler's lieutenants who famously said, you have nothing to fear if you have nothing to hide. These were the type of people Donald Trump surrounded himself with at the end.
Um, I should know that I'm not familiar with that story, actually. I, I, I did not, I did not, have not heard that uh, one. Uh, one of Trump's more level-headed senior aides in the Atlantic saying, I shudder to think what the cabinet would look like in a second term. Johnny McEntee, I expect, is already working on his list of names. I mean, one of the themes, I think, particularly in this period that, that culminates in the insurrection where things really, really teeter, where you have Gina Haspel, according to Peril, saying, like, we're looking at a right-wing coup. You've got Millie, like, all these people worried about, like, full spectrum democratic breakdown is that you've, it, it's pure distillation of what Trump wants in finding the people that will carry it out in McEntee or Jeffrey Clark of the DOJ, Olivia. That's exactly it. And people were being placed in positions out of loyalty. They were being placed specifically in these senior offices and laying the groundwork. And that was what was so concerning in the lead up, especially to January 6th, is that you know, watching this, especially having worked there, I had grave concerns about the fact that people were being shuffled around. I knew how they felt about Mark Esper. I had heard the comments uh, in the summer when he took a stand on what was happening with the protests. And, you know, there was all this talk about the Insurrection Act and everything. And the president at the time wanted to use military force for every possible solution that he wanted. I mean, that's what he did. He would turn to the military for it and people took a stand and stood against it. And so I think it's it's concerning about when people rise to power like this and the type of people that they place uh, that are that do their bidding and they're complete loyalists and you know they're willing to be loyal and do whatever it takes to stay in his good graces. And part of the problem, Miles, is that, you know, the, the, the sort of Trump's address right to the Republican Party uh, at that that event in Doral, which, again, is happening like on his property, it's their own way of sort of paying literal tribute. Um, you know, he's he's obviously trying to overstate his own. I mean, he was a net problem in that race. He was a drag on that race. And yet at the same time, it is the case that any support for the Republican Party writ large redounds to his benefit, like does empower him. And those two are it strikes me as indistinguishable at this moment in American democracy. Yeah, well, there, you know, Chris, there's a stunning level of silence among Republicans still about Donald Trump. They all know these things to be true. They all know that Donald Trump's rhetoric has led to violence, that he's actually a danger uh, from a public safety standpoint, because they say those things to people like me and Olivia behind the scenes when we engage with them. But they're still afraid to speak out because he wields this massive war chest that he wants to deploy in the elections. That's very concerning. Now, of course, whether or not Donald Trump's actually going to spend that money on candidates that he endorses is an open question, because uh, he seemingly wants to keep it for himself for a comeback bid. Um, but he's wielding that as another tool to instill fear among Republicans to get them to remain loyal to him. It's, it's why Olivia does what she does. It's why I launched the Renew America movement, frankly, so we could go support the good guys who are willing to stand up and go after the bad guys. And, 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 and frankly, I don't want to make this oversimplistic, Chris, this is really a fight between good and evil. And I know that sounds hyperbolic, but we're talking about some truly evil people in the former president's ranks, some very, very sick people who would love nothing more than to reinstall Donald Trump into the White House and to have an authoritarian president. And the fact that uh, surveys show that millions of Americans believe that he should be violently reinstalled into the White House uh, is, is a demonstration of how bad this has gotten. Olivia Troy and Miles Taylor, thank you both. Don't go anywhere. The chair of the January 6th Select Committee is here to talk about those 10 new subpoenas to former Trump officials, including Stephen Miller and Kaylee McEnany. Plus, I'll get his reaction to Donald Trump's midnight hail mailer to block those documents being turned over to their investigation. All that after the break. Don't go anywhere. 